We could start with the philosophy. What I've found is a struggling philosophy when it comes to preparing. Mm -hmm. Half the world is like, well, not half, but there are those that are like hardcore preppers who are building bunkers. There are those who are just kind of sensible and have a, 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 you know, a thought towards always having extra food in the pantry. Uh, but I would suggest the majority are not prepared for natural disasters at all. So if you could speak to, you know, beginning with this philosophy of why, why are we not ready for natural disasters? Why are we complacent? Why are we just, you know, seemingly not ready? I think that most people uh, are not prepared for disaster because that's also basic human psychology. Uh, we all have something called the ego defense mechanism. And just like the nerves in our fingertips uh, tell us that something hurts so we don't put our hands in the fire, it's basic human nature not to want to think about things that will scare us and make us sad and eventually drive us crazy. It, it protects our ego. Uh, as a result, a lot of people tend to live in denial that something will ever happen. And that's extremely dangerous, particularly in North America. Uh, for two reasons. Number one, we are, we have the most extreme weather of any place on planet earth. That's, that's just proven. That's just science. No okay, I'm going gonna, gonna to interrupt you to get you. Uh, um, I had no idea. Yeah. Give me, can you give me an anecdote reference to that, that particular stat? Uh, what I, let me think about where I learned this. Uh, because I'm thinking of sure. Japan and, and, and places yeah. like that with earthquakes and all that sort of stuff. But I had no idea North America was more susceptible. Uh, you know. Yeah, North America is, is the most extreme environment uh, anywhere on the planet, no matter where you live. There's going to be something. And what makes North America the most dangerous is that our cities haven't had time to really settle, as opposed to the rest of the world. Uh, Asia, Africa, uh, Europe, the cities tend to be a thousand years old and they tend to be relatively new because many is the place where people initially built the city and then discovered that that's not the place for it because there'll be an earthquake or the water will dry up or the oceans will rise. And you see a little bit of that uh, with the Anasazi in North America who had this amazing civilization, but then as we suspect as we are starting to prove that climate change took it all away. The problem is we don't have a continuous civilization in North America because of the invasion of Europeans who not only murdered the actual people but also murdered the history. So everything that we newcomers could have learned from those who came before us, we erased. And now we have to learn from scratch. The problem is uh, as, as ignorant arrogant newcomers to this new continent, uh, we just built wherever we thought was the best place to settle, i.e. Uh, commerce. So we said, wow, there's a peninsula that is right in the middle of a bay and it's subject to earthquakes. Let's call it San Francisco. What could possibly go wrong? Or, wow, let's build a city below the waterline and call it New Orleans. What could possibly go wrong? Or even really new cities. Let's, let's build a thriving megalopolis in the middle of the desert uh, and call it Las Vegas. Nothing could ever go wrong there. You know, I live in Los Angeles, which realistically is probably set up to support about 12 Chumash Native Americans. That's about it. And yet we have done enough stealing of water from Northern and Central California. We've done enough engineering to fool ourselves into believing that this environment that I live in is as sustainable as New York State. It is not. And it only takes a few tweaks to sever the lifelines to kill millions of my fellow Angelinos. So how, how does uh, this sort of larger societal um, uh, directive we've given ourselves if we came in, we'll build where we wanna build because it's pretty. Uh, how does that then filter down to what seems to be this overriding, it can't happen to me syndrome? Uh, most Americans are at a critical juncture because we are like rich kids living off the, the sweat of uh, generations that came before us. 
about 50 years ago, the United States post-World War II built up a safety net of infrastructure, of emergency services, of vaccinations uh, that really made disasters more of a nuisance than slate wipers. The problem is three generations later, most of us don't even know that those systems are in place. When those systems were established, most Americans were just coming out of the Great Depression. So they appreciated things like indoor plumbing and electricity, refrigeration. Uh, the idea if your house caught on fire, there would be people showing up to put it out. Uh, nowadays, we just expect it. And because we don't know how it works, and we don't even know that it works, most of us don't want to pay for it anymore. And so you see the myth of the individual in post-baby boomer United States. This idea that it's me, me and mine, I'll take care of me, I got what it takes, I know what I'm doing, I don't need anybody else, so government, keep your hands off my social security. That's all a myth. We don't understand anymore how interconnected we are. And because of that, we are severing those connections, which now make us even more vulnerable. When the antagonist in this story when it is a natural disaster, something that does not care about your social standing, Although more on that later in recovery, because boy, have I discovered the difference between the haves and the have nots when it comes to reacting to a disaster. It's stark uh, and the have nots are screwed. Uh, so often, you know, uh, again, I'm getting into recovery, but it's, it's just been eye opening to me, uh, you know, again, as a Canadian too, going out and interviewing these people. However, the catastrophes that happen are are overriding. They're 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 global. They 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 are they they are not a far right or a far left. They put they pick no political boundary. They also pick no geographical boundary. And yet the complacency, the complacency, ironically, is also like that. The complacency is there with rich people and poor people alike, haves and have-nots, ethnic races or Caucasian or not. Uh, everyone seems to be well. Yeah, but it but it can't happen to me. It really can't. And I see what you're saying. We created this very insular, well, of course it can't happen to me. Look at me, I, but uh, I'm in my apartment. <laughs> I'm in my cocoon, but, but a category five hurricane doesn't care in about, uh, about apartment windows. How, um, I guess I, sh I could ask this question. If I'm trying to also premise what comes next in, in, that, in that, this particular act, do we really need to prepare? Does Les Stroud really need to make this series? Do we, I mean, it's just going to come along and go along and, and you know, it's just another, it's just be another hurricane. Do we really need to prepare? Uh, or is it such that if we don't prepare, the, the, the catastrophe to our lives might be bigger than we think? Everyone needs to prepare for the basic reason that even if the emergency services perform exactly as they were designed to perform, there will be a lag time. And within that lag time, you are vulnerable. While you are waiting, for 21st century emergency services to show up, you're in the Stone Age. And so you need to take care of you and yours, not forever. You don't need to rebuild your Mad Max compound and start eating your neighbors. What you need to do is just maintain and stay alive long enough until the cavalry can arrive. One of the things I'm fond of saying in this particular subject matter of, prepare, of preparing is, you know, a prepper thinks he's going to be sitting on his porch with a shotgun saying, stay away from my larder, my supplies. And, you know, my, uh, my example, what I think of is like, are you really? And when your daughter comes to you with tears in her eyes and says, can you please look after my best friend's family? They're in a bad way. Can they come and stay? You're going to, you're going to, you're not, you know, only a freak show. And then you know, that, Obviously, there's a few freak shows out there, but a freak show, but but normal people are not going to say no. I've been building this bunker for six years. You can't let your best friend's parents come in. That's not going to happen. Um, maybe speak to that. Do you, how do you feel about the? Paint me the difference between the prepper attitude and the 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 just the attitude of what you just explained to me. Just good preparation. There is a dark side to the prepper community. And, and it's a fringe element, but like all fringe elements, the loudest people always get the most attention. And the fringe element 
believes that society collapsing would actually be a good thing because there is a small group of individuals who don't like society. They haven't risen as far as they want to. They, they have not accomplished what they think they're capable of. And they think that society, civilization is actually the problem, it's holding them back. And they would love to see everything collapse because then they could rise from the ashes like the phoenix that they know that they are. And Hollywood has helped that. You sort of see the, in every post-apocalyptic society, there are people who were nobody and then they rise and thank God. Uh, that's not the way it's going to be because even the roughest, toughest wannabe warlord eventually is going to get testicular cancer. That's actually, I, you said a great thing there. That's not the way it's going to be. Everybody has this imagination of going out and hunting deer in the forest while the cities burn. I'm like, no, <laughs> it's yeah. not, it's not going to work like that. In fact, what's going to happen is you're going to have a flood. Yeah. There's going to be a flood in your town. So, so now what? Uh, sort of thing. And that I do find that, that such a stark difference. Actually, let me a quick tangent because this does yeah. fit within within the um mode of preparation. Why did the take toilet paper thing happen? How did that come about? There's a reason that you're not allowed to shout fire in a crowded theater. And I believe that goes back to basic human evolutionary psychology. Because the truth is we as Homo sapiens as apes are not meant to be at the top of the food chain. We're in the middle. We were as much the hunted as the hunter, probably a lot more the hunted. And so that feeling of vulnerability, that fear of being prey is hardwired into us. That is why so much of civilization, no matter where you live on this planet, no matter when you lived, so much of civilization is designed around calming us the hell down. Uh, because it doesn't take a lot to panic people. And the more people there are, the easier it is to panic. And that's why if you shout fire in a crowded theater, most of the people are not gonna say, well, I don't, I don't smell smoke. Hey, that's ridiculous, I'm watching a movie. They go, what? So that is why in the recent pandemic, when people screamed, oh my God, the world supply of toilet paper is gone. Most people didn't say, well, first of all, I know that's not true. There's, you can still make it. Second of all, I got plenty of tissues and wet wipes and whatnot. I'll be fine. Uh, people go, oh my God, toilet paper. And they flip out. And that's, that's human history is, is myths spawn panic, panic spawns violence. And then before you know it, Americans of Japanese descent are being put in camps. Walk down the priorities for me. Um, I'm just... Joe Schmo, and I want to. I want to get. I want to be. I want to be better prepared. Well, for what? Oh, uh, just generically speaking, I want to be better prepared. Yeah. Or I'm also, and and I know I live in Ohio, and I have to deal with cold and blizzards. But you know, my my aunt lives down in Florida. I want her to be better prepared too. So, what is the, what's the generic sort of walk down of preparation stages and, and things? The first stage of preparation is research you have to know exactly what you're preparing for. And this, this goes to why people panic because they don't know exactly what they're preparing for. And fictional media sometimes does a lot more harm than good because people sometimes imagine, oh my God, uh, there's a problem, there's a crisis, things are gonna fall apart. Uh, I need to load up on 10,000 rounds of ammunition. Really? The first thing you got to do is figure out what exactly is the threat. I live in Southern California. The threat is earthquakes. Okay. So what is an earthquake going to actually do? It's not going to break open the ground and release uh, the lizard people that I have to defend myself from. It's going to cut off the water. Once again, I live in a desert. If I know enough about where I live, then I know that water is my number one priority. If I lived in, say, Washington State, which also suffers from earthquakes, my number one priority will probably be staying warm and dry, especially in Western Washington as opposed to Eastern Washington. So geography, critical, critical. Uh, you have to know where you live, what the local threats are, and then 
prepare accordingly because what helps people in San Diego is not going to help the same people in Maine. Where do you find this information out? Who do you turn to? The best source of disaster prep is your local government because despite what fringe elements in the prepper community want you to believe, your local government actually wants you to stay alive. They want you to be prepared because they know when a disaster strikes, they can't be everywhere at once. So they need you to save yourself long enough for them to save you. So all of their websites have exact lists of what you will need and they will have exact information about what the threat is. So before you go anywhere, before you go down that rabbit hole, which more so than not eventually leads people to Stormfront, just go to your local government's website and they'll tell you, here's what might happen and here's what you need. Yeah, and even just to the point of, you can ask neighbors and that does help, but you're also getting a very biased uh, opinion there. Um, I've seen a lot of that too, even in um, talking with, uh, I talked with a meteorologist about Hurricane Michael, for example, because the people I interviewed about Michael told me that, um, you know, Hurricane Michael jumped from category one to a category three. And they were going on and on. And then I talked to a meteorologist and she said, yeah, no, it didn't. She said, in, in, in fact, it spent 28 hours as a category two, <laughs> right? So it, the, the, the public's version of events uh, including the public's version of what can go on here, can range everything from, oh, don't worry about it, nothing ever happens here, to, yeah, we're living on the edge here, everything in between. You know, Les, I think one of the most important things you can do in preparation is invest in your neighbors. Hmm. Because <clears throat> the Mad Max scenario is that everybody's going to turn on everybody else. First of all, that's not going to happen. It almost never happens. And also, barring a global thermonuclear war, all disasters are going to be temporary. When the pandemic hit, the first thing I did was talk to my neighbors and say, listen, let's all keep in touch and see uh, what we all have and pool our resources. And I didn't just do that out of the kindness of my heart. I did that because I'm going to have to live with these people for a very long time. And we all need to be on good terms. And this myth of the alpha male, of the individual sort of rising from the ashes, is not how humanity rose to become the dominant species on the planet. We did it together. We did it first in, in small extended family groups of primates, and then we did it in tribes, then we did it in empires and nation states. So we all need each other, whether we like it or not. And so investing in your community is the best survival skill you can have. That's actually, and we'll see with um, in the recovery phase, actually that comes out a lot in um, South Dakota uh, during the Atlas, they call it the Atlas storm, a big winter storm, five days of horizontal snow that literally killed thousands of cows that suffocated, suffocated them to death uh, um, with too much wind. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, they all pulled together. They all dug each other out, they all helped each other. And then we, you know, we do have the stories of looting in other scenarios uh, as well, which are often, it would seem, though realistic and it happens, also very overblown at the same time. Uh, there was one particular story in Florida where there was stories of policemen looting um, a Walmart. Turns out they were given the go ahead to loot the Walmart to provide for the people in need. Let's go back to where you were at in terms of preparation. We've gained the knowledge. I know what kind of area I lived in now. I know, I know what's I live in now. I know that it's either an earthquake or I'm in Louisiana and I'm right at the ocean's edge. I, I got I got flooding to deal with. Um, we've got the knowledge base. What's our first concern? Right now, the first concern always is to stay calm uh, because when you panic, your frontal lobe this part of the brain that, that has raised us above our animal urges, that switches off. You know, how many of us have done just the dumbest things we never would have done ordinarily? And then you say, why did I do it? Oh, I panicked. When you panic, you forget to think and you might end up doing more harm than good. Uh, that's the big problem. That's particularly why in every science fiction disaster film, uh, especially in the 50s, uh, when we trusted the government, the first thing the government officials say is, well, we don't want to cause a panic. 
because how many people get trampled? Uh, how many fires start? How many fights accidentally break out just because people are freaking out? So you want to be calm and you want to think, well, what is my first priority? Okay, the earthquake has happened. All right, is everybody okay? All right, all right. Now, what did our previous research tell us to do? But, but go before the earthquake. Okay. Go before the earthquake. Um, and, and it still fits because remaining calm, even right, just right. knowing something's coming. But you know something's coming. You live in Louisiana and they're saying it's going to be uh, yet again. Uh, and we can, by the way, tangent, um, one of the things I heard over and over again down in the panhandle was every year we hear storm of the century. Every year we hear, yeah, this is the big one. And then nothing happens. So when Michael hit, we were just, we, by that point, people had cried, the, you know, press had cried wolf, which by the way, on another tangent led to the distinction between listening to local press versus national press, far greater to listen to local who are saying the flooding is coming up onto the Walmart parking lot at five and, and Smith streets, you know, um, whereas the national press is sim simply saying storm of the century. Um, so anyway, the storm of the century is coming and we are calm and we've done our research. What's our first priority uh, in, in, and let's say it's not coming tomorrow, but it's coming in, they're expecting it in a few weeks. Uh, give a little more long-term preparation. What's, our, what's the first thing we look after? If you know that something is coming, uh, the first thing you have to do is listen to your local government official to see, do you have to evacuate or do you not have to evacuate? Uh, and then you have to prioritize what of your physical possessions are precious and need to be taken with you and what don't. And this is the problem is sometimes when, and this happens in where I live, even in Los Angeles with, uh, with fires, is too many people don't prepare to evacuate uh, soon enough. And so they end up scrambling and grabbing whatever they can and getting in the car which would be understandable if fires happened once in a century. But we have an actual season for fires. So people should already know that the photo albums need to be close to the car if you need to go, uh, as opposed to things that could burn and could be replaced by the insurance company. Well ahead of any disaster, what should we be storing and how, how much? When you talk about building your survival kit, You've got to, once again, uh, not just think about your environment, but also think about you. When you're preparing food, stock up on things you like to eat. You know, don't go on a, a prepper site that tells you to buy 10,000 pounds of lentils if you hate lentils. Because the problem is, let's say the disaster doesn't happen, then you're stuck with 10,000 pounds of lentils you will never eat. So if you stock up on food you like, You'll end up eating it anyway. So that's, I'm just going to interject, so it's freaking hilarious because you just replaced my narration. That's exactly what I said, but it's me on camera and I'm trying I'm to minimize how much I'm on camera. <laughs> Verbatim, I even use the word, I use, I even use lentils. It's exactly what I said. I end the line by saying, bottom line is, if you don't like lentils, don't put them in your survival storage. But that is, and, and that's, you're right. People think, oh no, you have to have 20 pounds of rice and 20, 10 pounds of, and, and, and spam. Why do they always push spam? I would probably vomit if I had to eat spam every day. So. You know, always, always think about, you should always have uh, two survival kits. There should be a larger kit for sheltering in place. And there should be a smaller one for if you have to go. Now, if you have to go is very different than say, if you're sheltering in place, particularly where I live in Southern California, water is a priority. Cans have their own water in them, which is very different. So my shelter in place kit has a lot more cans than say, if I have to go because those cans are heavy. And if I carry them with me, I'm gonna sweat and I'm actually gonna end up losing more water. So for me, uh, things that are light and easy to travel, they are much more important for the go back. And you also have to think of what is the environment that you're gonna be traversing. You know, uh, survival kits will tell you things like, well, you know, you've always gotta have a good saw and, you know, to chop firewood, something to chop firewood for. Well, I'm in the middle of a city. I'm not gonna be chopping firewood. You know, for me, 
what would be a lot more valuable would be a fold up scooter. So me and my, my wife and my son and a backpack for my dog, we could scoot away when the roads are blocked. I mean, basically what you're saying, and, and I, again, I teach the same thing. You have to take into account the variables of who you are, where you are, what you're doing, when you're doing it. Uh, all of those things come into play. And that's very, you're very right. In fact, with the kit that I've already been filming, there's no wilderness survival stuff in the kit. I'm, I'm talking about your aunt Edna, who's 72 years old, but still very able, but has to take off. I'm talking about her. What's yeah. the point of giving her a survivor man machete? <laughs> yeah, th this is the, the, the common, I think, misconception is that your, your bug out bag should be the ability to escape into the woods and live off bugs and rabbits. Well, most Americans live in mega cities. There really is no wilderness for me to go to except for a park, which is gonna be crammed with other people by the time I get there. So you really have to think to yourself, not so much as a survivor man in the wilderness, but to be homeless. Preparation on the subject matter of establishing and maintaining communication because when it happens communication's gone yeah. and even the little process of maybe verizon is still operating but you forgot to charge your cell phone and now you have no power uh, or maybe verizon uh, is operating and you're on us cellular and they're blown out that's what happened in michael in fact in michael forget which one but one entire company was gone the other company was still up and running so it was all this cell phone sharing Talk to me about communications before uh, that will lead you to communications after. Communication is critical and it's more ironically, technology has made it harder than it used to be because time was we all had a landline which was on a different wire than the power grid. So even if the power went down, the phone might still be working and the emergency services were better able to send out advanced warning because they could ring every phone in your town all at once and everybody would pick up and get the warning. Now, a lot of people don't even have landlines. They have cell phones and we can get warnings on our cell phones unless they're charging or in the other room or uh, just run out of juice. And so therefore, because we have more diffuse communications, it is harder for a central authority to disseminate the information that you need to know. So the upshot is you need a plan more than you did back then. Uh, every family, every group, you need to know what would I do if we were all someplace else and we couldn't talk to each other. If, if mom's at work, kids at school, dad's at home, uh, grandma is at another home, where do we all go? How do we all get together? And that's one of the most important things because people lose each other when everybody's looking for everybody else. So when it comes to a family coming together, you need to designate who's gonna stay in place and who's gonna come find them. And what about utilizing um, uh, Facebook groups and things like that? When it comes to good communication, uh, one of the things you also need to have in your survival kit, so to speak, is a trusted media source. And you can't do that overnight. Uh, when the disaster happens, you can't suddenly go on the internet and look for sources because you're gonna get flooded with information. Most of it's not gonna be true. So way before something goes wrong, you have to figure out who do you trust, who is a truthful source of information. And then that's who you go to because the rumor mill is gonna get a lot of people killed. I know in the case of um, Irma, which by the way, in, on the Virgin Islands is nicknamed Irma Maria because there's only 12 days between those two hurricanes. So they just call, they just call them both Irma Maria. Uh, they established, there was a St. John's Facebook roll call page that uh, enabled your sister who lives in Wisconsin to go on and see a message, there's a message, and Max has said, hey, we're dry, we're warm, we're safe, nobody's hurt. I think just as simple as that. Uh, how is it better now with the advent of social media? 
uh, and easier now for us to stay in touch during a disaster? You know, in a strange way, it's easier with social media to stay in touch. Uh, that happened to me on 9-11. Uh, I was in New York. The phones were jammed. Nobody could get through to me except my then girlfriend, now wife, who contacted me on something called AOL, on something called instant messaging. I tried to go on the internet with dial up to figure out what was going on. And suddenly bop, the window came up and it was her. Are you okay? I'm, I'm all right. Don't worry about it. We're going to be fine. Uh, so there are different ways for you to get in touch with people that you already know and already trust. What you don't want to do again is suddenly start looking for sources of information from people you've never heard of. Yeah, that's a good one. I'm actually going to include in this. Uh, um, one of the guys talks a little bit uh, well enough about uh, ham radios, which it's great. It's, it's pretty outside the norm, but nonetheless, especially in rural America, somebody somewhere operates ham radios and they actually keep, you know, those, those, the amateur operators, they keep those things going in a place like the U.S. Virgin Islands. That apparently it's really helpful. Uh, um, and also most of the people who are geeky enough to operate ham radios are also totally into the disaster and that's when they light up. It's almost yeah. like their chance to, to be, be something, be someone sort of thing. So it becomes this blending of a much older technology and, uh, and then now Facebook pages and roll calls and, and, and things like that. How do we as individuals um, maintain ourselves in the midst of it, when it's when it's bearing down, what are the what are the ways that we can not get hurt? You know, the by following a trusted source of information, uh, even as the disaster is coming towards you, say a storm, you know what you're dealing with, and knowledge is the best cure for panic because panic is the mushroom that grows in the dark manure-filled ground of our imagination. Uh, if we don't know what we're facing, we can imagine something infinitely worse. And so you've got to stay informed and then you can plan accordingly. I'm caught on one spot thing you're saying. I'm, I can't, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, how do I figure out who I trust? How do I figure out who the trustworthy sources are? If I'm overly cynical, I don't want to call the government. Uh, but but if I'm if I'm just a normal human being, how do I how do I get past that cynicism and and, and where where do we find the these because you keep you've referenced this a couple of times about getting the information you trust. But where I'm I'm sitting in Southern Oregon right now, and I'm moved here from Canada. If I really wanted to find out, well, how dangerous are the wildfires? You know, where, which by the way. We have ash landing on our car. That's how bad they are here. But uh, where, where do I, where do I, where do we go? You know, emergency services all have their own websites. They all have their own Twitter pages, and they don't have an agenda other than keeping you alive. And that's where government is good, because private sources, and particularly in the, in the United States, are for profit. And how do you get profit? when you're in private news. You want attention. How do you get attention? You've got to sex up everything that you talk about. So you might see someone, as I did once during a hurricane, uh, I saw a newscaster paddling down the middle of a street in a kayak uh, until somebody walked right behind her, making us see that it was actually only six feet of, or six inches of water. Uh, if it's a private media source that needs your money and needs your eyes, uh, then they are going to go for the sexiest, craziest stuff that they can do. Whereas, say, in Southern California, if you follow CAL FIRES, they have no other agenda than just keeping you alive and keeping you out of their way so they can get to the fire and not have to rescue you. So, so that's where government is really good. So speak to FEMA then. Where does FEMA uh, figure into this picture? Up until 9-11, FEMA was its own agency. And that was a good thing because the director of FEMA had a direct line to the president. Uh, as we saw in hurricanes past, director of FEMA could be in the Virgin Islands right there at Cyril King Airport, get on his cell phone and call in those C-130s. After 9-11, FEMA was absorbed into the Department of Homeland Security. 
And Department of Homeland Security's post 9-11 goal was stop terrorism. So therefore the majority of the money and the love went to the folks trying to stop the terrorists bringing the bomb in. And FEMA did had to go through channels in order to get to the top. And we saw a little bit of that in Hurricane Katrina where Michael Brown, Browning, uh, wasn't just incompetent, he also had to go through his boss, Michael Chertoff, who he did not get along with. So that extra layer of bureaucracy uh, stifled FEMA. Now they've, they've made some changes to how FEMA operates. It's more independent than it was right after 9-11. Uh, but it is still part of something bigger. The biggest problem FEMA or any of the disaster services have now is stockpiling. Most people don't want to stockpile in, as individuals because it's expensive, right? They don't want to spend the money. That's exactly the same case on the government level. Up until the end of the Cold War, the United States federal government had massive stockpiles of emergency supplies prepositioned all over the country in case of a nuclear war. And while that war never happened, those stockpiles could always be drawn upon during a natural disaster. After the Cold War ended, all those stockpiles went away because they were expensive. And the government thought it was much more efficient to buy those supplies on the day of the disaster from the big box stores. But here's the rub. The big box stores, they don't stockpile either because it's expensive. They have to turn over their stock every 24 hours. So the risk is if you have two disasters at the same time, there's simply not going to be enough. And that actually happened when Superstorm Sandy hit New York. My wife turned to me, we live in LA. She said, we need to get a generator. We've always talked about getting a generator. If there's an earthquake, oh my God, look at these people in New York. We gotta get one. So I did, I went, got in the car. I went to my big store and there's no stock room there. What you see is what there is. And there were no generators. And I asked the guy working there, what happened? And he said, well, FEMA came this morning and took them all to New York. So in our quest for profit and efficiency, we have gutted our insurance policy. I know that, uh, yeah, I, I knew this of FEMA. Uh, one of the, th I spoke with FEMA at one point and, and, and um, one of the things uh, she, the woman I spoke with, helped me to understand. I, I had no idea, I, I didn't know what it stood for. Then I, oh, uh, uh, Federal Emergency Management uh, Administration or so. Uh, agency. Agency. And then when you, if you talk to the man on the street or the woman on the street, a lot of them will be like, ah, oh, FEMA doesn't know what they're doing. They didn't help us at all. So, okay, well, that's because FEMA is not a building full of warm bodies ready to jump in an airplane and come out and sit. They're a management agency. That's what they are. And so to their credit or, or you know, on their side, for example, at, at Irma, there was five flights worth of water distributed to the airport in St. Thomas. And they sat there on the tarmac for a week because there was no infrastructure in St. Thomas to distribute the water. So it wasn't FEMA's fault. FEMA came, kaboom, here you go, fresh water for, so it's the on the ground people that really come to, to matter. There is another deficit, a recent deficit in crisis management in the United States, and that is in personnel. Because up until 9-11, the National Guard was our home army when there was a disaster. You could pull onto the National Guard. And the National Guard only went overseas in an emergency. The last time the National Guard had really gone overseas was in the Korean War when we were caught really unprepared. That's all changed now. Because of our commitments worldwide in this global war on terror, the National Guard units are now in the permanent rotation of the regular United States military. The most glaring example was in Hurricane Katrina when portions of the Louisiana National Guard were away in Iraq. Well, that's normal now. So when you have a disaster in your state, in Florida, in California, in Oregon, you better pray to God that your local National Guard units have not been deployed overseas because they very well may be. 
Well, I think, that, and that's what's happened is the stories that I constantly keep getting are in the fact that it's the local agencies in terms of the local Catholic church uh, here in Oregon. When I went, I actually went down to the fires where, I mean, everything was just, everything is eight inches high, right? And black. And there was a couple there, an old couple, and they had a, uh, there's an organization there called Samaritan's Purse who was helping them out. Uh, the e EPA, I guess, was there with the hazmat suited guys checking out all of that. Um, but what's come out of all of this is that the, there, are, there are interim temporary helps like barbecue relief or Team Rubicon. But the, and then there are long-term like FEMA and your insurance policies. But in fact, the heavy lifting is primarily done by all of the local, um, um, what you call, not benefactors, but um, benevolent organizations. They just, they're there. And Red Cross seems to always get a glowing, a glowing review when it comes to agencies. Yes, this, this started since the 1980s, there has been uh, this anti-government movement in the United States that government tends to be bloated and inefficient and it's a waste of taxpayer dollars when uh, the private sector is so much more efficient and can sort of rock it in there and get the job done for a fraction of the cost. And that sounds great on paper. The problem is at this point only our government, the state and federal governments can build up to scale to handle the magnitude of these problems because Natural disasters are big and they don't always wait for the next one to strike. Sometimes you get hit more than once. So as we are gutting the infrastructure that nobody seems to wanna to pay for, uh, we're leaving ourselves more vulnerable. You'd make a very good Canadian, Max. <laughs> well, I'll welcome you up there. Um, let's go to recovery. Uh, where, where is our... Uh, where are our priorities immediately upon shifting from it's hitting the fan and, and now it's past the fan? We're in recovery mode now. What's our, where are our priorities there? As an individual, uh, you have to remember that, that recovery may take a very long time because it also depends uh, as the federal forces pull back, as the emergency forces pull back, you will be left at the mercy of your local government. So the question to ask yourself now is, do I live in a well-run city or county uh, before the disaster? Is it a good government? Is it an efficient government? And of course, no American will ever admit that their government is efficient and works well, but some work a lot better than others. Uh, I was born in New York, grew up in LA, lived back and forth in New York and LA. And I can tell you, uh, and I won't say who's who, but I can tell you that one of the cities works really hard on a good day to try to keep its citizens alive and the trains running and the lights on and the sewage flowing in the right direction. Another one pretty much leaves you on your own. And so I know which city I would want to be in when it's time to rebuild, because one of them will rebuild. And the other one, yeah, maybe there's something shiny to look at over there. So we have that on a micro level as well, then I suppose between say, well, I'm in Southern Oregon. I got Jack Skeen, Jack, Josephine County and Jackson County, two counties, for example, separated by uh, 40 miles, but drastically different in how they're run. That's where you have to keep an idea. When it comes to rebuilding, you should be studying now about the place you live in. How well run is it? Uh, what are the corruption scandals? Are the people that you voted for or maybe didn't vote for, are they qualified? Because these are gonna be the people responsible for rebuilding your life, whether you like it or not. What, and it's something to think about, will this disaster completely wipe out your life and will you have to move or can you rebuild? What are our greatest concerns physically when it's happened? And, and, that, and that's hard because like, well, where am I? Am I in a snowstorm or I'm in a flood or an earthquake? So we, we do need to speak somewhat generally or you can just touch on some of the variations. Depending on where you are is going to depend on what the second and third order effects of a disaster are. 
because let's never forget when a disaster hits, it's not just going to kill people in the moment. It's going to kill people for days, weeks, months, maybe even years afterwards by knocking out that 21st century safety net, that first world shield we all live under and don't even realize half the time. What's going to happen when the sewage lines break and there are outbreaks? You know, what's going to happen uh, if there is additional crime? You know, what's going to happen simply if your local doctor that you have to go to, if you have a pre-existing medical condition, if she or he is simply too busy with disaster patients? You know, this is this is the problem we're seeing now in COVID pandemic, which is we're focusing just on the people who are dying of COVID, but what about all the people who are dying of other illnesses and injuries and accidents simply because they can't get into the hospitals because the hospitals are choked with COVID patients. So even if that COVID patient recovers and comes out, somebody may die because they couldn't get in and get emergency care. Let's go to something kind of fun, but um, you were telling me about it when we were on the phone. With this particular special that I'm doing, like you say, an overall look at it, it's a 90 minute special on to survive, it's called Surviving Disasters. But as you know of my work, I've always philo philosophically been about uh, making things accessible, relatable, uh, not too highfalutin academically, but not, but not pablum either, just I'm very straight that way. Um, but you really told me that that was a fun, way of putting it when you said, look, the, the zombie survival guide was nothing more than a real survival guide with a, with a, with, I, forget, I forget how you said it. So yeah, please, please say that again and elaborate for me on, I'll just say, ask it this way. Why does that guide work in a fun sense for real life? When it comes to educating people about disaster, uh, fiction has a role to play because the best way to circumvent people's fears is to tell them a story. You know, if you're trying to educate people about a real disaster, you're crashing right into the ego defense mechanism. And there's a good chance you're going to scare people away, put them to sleep, or piss them off. But if you make the threat fictional and the solutions factual, then people are still learning about clean water, basic first aid, home defense, plumbing, electricity, infrastructure, while they're reading a zombie book. That's perfect. It is a lot of fun. It's a, it's a very fun way to, to actually to do that, um, to learn through it. I guess I'll ask you this way. What do you wish people knew uh, when it comes to who we are as North Americans and dealing with national disasters, both on the, on the larger level, but also on the micro personal level? My hope is that uh, when it comes to disasters, people understand that knowledge should help calm you down, not scare you. The anxiety comes from not knowing what you're up against. And I think the more people understand really what a disaster can do, uh, the calmer they will feel, because then you really got a sense of it. It's sort of like the shark in Jaws. As long as it's just the POV of the shark and the dark music is playing, you don't know what that is. But in act three, you see the shark, you say, oh, okay. It's a 20 footer, 25. All right, I know what I'm dealing with. Uh, in the words of Arnold Schwarzenegger in Predator, if it bleeds, we can kill it. That's understanding your enemy. And so if we understand how do hurricanes work? How do earthquakes work? What can they actually do? What are the real threats? in this, maybe not what you thought from watching a Hollywood movie. Then you're able to ration your most precious resource, which is time. You don't wanna waste all that time trying to learn everything, stockpile everything, prepare for everything, because you can't. Know what the issue is and just plan for that. That will also give you peace of mind when the crisis happens, and then you'll be able to help calm down the people in your family. So what can I do? What, what can I, what's the basics of what I, that kind of middle American can do to prepare? Preparing for a disaster is not that hard. It is not a full-time job. You don't want to be a full-time prepper because then you're wasting your life uh, 
if you're if you're doing nothing all day but preparing for the apocalypse, you're the example of the little boy in the Shel Silverstein poem who was so afraid of being drowned by the ocean, he cried so much, he drowned in his own tears. You don't want that. Most Americans have a little bit of spare time in the course of a year to do something that they want to do. Take a little bit of that little bit of spare time and just learn a little bit about what you're doing. Uh, because it's not going to be the apocalypse. You're not going to have to learn how to build a toilet. But you should take the time to learn how to unstop your toilet when the plumber can't show up. When I was at Comic-Con once, I was uh, doing a zombie survival talk. And there was uh, a young person in the audience who was in a wheelchair and raised their hand and, and said, jokingly, would I be the first to die in a zombie apocalypse? And I said, no, you would probably be the last to go because you understand something that most people don't, which is your own vulnerabilities. You wake up every day and have to mentally calibrate, how do I navigate this world uh, that is not set up for me? You already have a survival instinct. And that's going to be the problem with most people is that shock, ignorance, and denial is going to be the greatest killer because a lot of people are going to get hurt or even die in a disaster trying to make that mental shift from everything is okay to, oh, wow, I really need to survive. Complacency. Yeah. You have to be aware of your own vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And everyone should think that way. Uh, what are your vulnerabilities? We all need to eat. We all need to sleep. We all need to keep warm. We all need to fight off an infection. But what about all our personal issues? Who needs glasses? Who needs batteries for their hearing aids? Who has medication? You know, this is, this is one of the myths of, of the great uh, Hollywood apocalyptic stories of the people sort of rising from the ashes is if that were to happen, how many people would we lose simply because there's no insulin? And speak to PTSD because I think that's another aspect that people do not expect yeah. is PTSD after a storm I'll give yeah. you an example. The guy was telling me he was sitting there with his wife to uh, a couple of weeks or something after the storm, uh, and he was watching. And in the movie, they, they, I'm not sure if they were watching The Perfect Storm with George Clooney or not, but he said all of a sudden he realized that he was gripping the armchair. And he looked over at his wife, and she was cinched up and gripping the armchair as well. And Caroline and I were in a rollover in Mongolia. Two weeks later, we were watching a cartoon, The Incredibles. And in that movie, there's a rollover and both of us went in a cartoon. So speak to, you know, the PTSD is, is a shock, I think, to people. You know, we, we throw the word triggered around a lot. But what it really is supposed to mean is that when you see something in the present that sparks a traumatic memory, you are triggered. And in a disaster, you will go through a traumatic incident. And so most people will have some degree of post-trauma and it's a whole spectrum of it. Some people will be deeply shocked to their core. Some people will just move on like nothing ever happened. And most people will probably be in the middle and then something will remind them of that. But you should always be aware of it. And it's not a question of being strong or weak. And it's just a question of how much trauma do you absorb and for how long? Because also you have to remember that some people will experience deep trauma out of survivor's guilt when nothing bad has ever happened to them. I, I knew a soldier uh, who was having crippling PTSD. He'd never been in combat, but he had sent young men into combat every single day while he sat safely behind a desk. And that did more damage to him than if he could have been with his men. So there's always going to be some level of trauma, not just for the people who are in it, but also for the people who are away from it, wondering if their loved ones are okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that, that, it, that it's expanded fields, not just you, uh, but people who are worried for you. I know, and as far as when it is just you, lots of references to, oh yeah, all I have to hear is a gusty wind now and my heart starts racing. That, that would be spooky.